In verse 10, it says that John was so overwhelmed, he started to bow down before the angel. And John says, don't do that. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Basically, what God has promised is that paradise is coming to earth. The real paradise that people have always longed for, God has designed. It only can come when the true king of kings, Christ himself, returns to the earth. And the way paradise comes is first Satan, the enemy of God, has to be restrained. Now I want to show you something in chapter 20 for you to understand the millennium. It says in verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So either John saw a great angel coming from heaven with a chain in his hand and a key to the bottomless pit, or he saw we don't know what. See, John is writing down what he actually saw, and John saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key and a chain. And verse 2 says, he laid hold on the dragon the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. You ought to read the commentaries from Bible commentators that don't know what this could possibly mean. And they say, this means the church goes to India and <laughs> confronts the false religions and tells people about Christ, and they keep doing it until everyone gets saved. But it says the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and Satan, and bound in a thousand years. But, but Martin Luther said it can't mean that. And John Calvin said it can't mean that. And so immediately the Bible can't possibly mean what it very clearly and simply states. And in verse 3 it says that he is kept from deceiving the nations for a thousand years. And verse 4 ends with, they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And verse 5 says, the dead did not live until the thousand years was over. And it says at the end of verse 6, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. And in verse 7 it says, and when the thousand years have ended, Satan is released. But yet, more than half of all the Bible teachers in the world say that a thousand years repeated six times does not mean a thousand years. So, ah, millennialists and covenant theologians and Basically, the Reformed churches all say that 1,000, which is the word mille, does not mean 1,000. And they have immediately taken 20% of the Bible, and the only thing they can do with it is make it an allegory. They say all those verses one-fifth of the Bible. That Israel is going to return to a land and that they are going to make the land bloom and they're going to build a temple and all the nations of the earth are going to come to, to Jerusalem. And then the Christmas carols are going to be fulfilled that Christ is going to sit on the throne of his father David. They say, no, that, all of that is about church planting, and not about Israel. But the millennium in the Bible is when the Messiah himself is actually ruling on the earth. Revelation 20 was promised to David, predicted in the Psalms and Prophets, promised to Mary. It's a part of the Lord's Prayer, and it's what we see all the way through the Bible. And the only way you can understand the majority of the prophecies of the Old Testament is to have them be connected to where God says they're connected, the millennium. So the millennium is described in the Bible as the earth 
has physical changes, the curse is lifted, creation is redeemed, and the whole earth gets to know about God. But it's not eternity, it's not heaven, because there is still death, there is still sin, people have their own farm, and the earth is producing fruit. Now, look what happens starting in verse 7 of Revelation 20. Satan is released in verse 7, and he goes right back to work in verse 8, deceiving the nations. And he gets everyone to come and march on Jerusalem, where all the saints are. And in verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. So Jesus said that hell was created for the devil and his angels. And that's where God puts him forever. But look at verse 9 again. It says, they went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the, the camp, it says in English, of the saints. The place where the saints were living around the temple. That idea of camping, living in a tent, is something that is all the way through the minds of the apostles. Peter said in, in 2 Peter 1 that I'm going to sooner or later have to take down this tent. I'm not going to live here forever. I'm going home to heaven. So I wrote in my Bible, heaven is home, life is camping. Now basically, we could summarize all the Old Testament millennial promises by looking at how the first pastor of the first church described the future. In Acts chapter 15, James says some very interesting things. James says that Simon, or Peter, declared how God had first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. He just described the church, the Gentiles, all the nations hearing about the gospel, and God calling out of them a people, the church. Now listen to what the very first pastor, the very first church that was under the inspiration of God's spirit and that was teaching the Bible says happens next. James summarizes what all the Old Testament promises about the coming millennium meant in relation to the church. Verse 16, after this, after the church, after the Gentiles and the church age, after this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. James understood that God's plan for the church was for a period, and then he was done with the church, and he takes the church out of this world, and he starts using Israel as he always intended to use them to reach the world during the tribulation. And now we come to the most sobering part of the Bible. Jesus is so holy that he cannot allow those who choose to refuse him to go unpunished. Uh, Bethany asks, what's the purpose of having the millennium? Um, from a human perspective, I would say that it's to fulfill the 20% of the Bible that God promised is going to happen that has never happened. So basically, there's an awful lot of stuff God has promised on oath that he's going to do that he has never done. One of the most sobering things about hell is that Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. Most of us always think of Jesus as loving and kind and gentle, but Jesus talked twice about hell and judgment for every one time he talked about all the wonderful things of heaven. And basically, hell has this horror suffering the blackness of darkness forever, Jesus warned about. And then in Mark 9.44, Jesus adds that hell is kind of like a garbage dump where there are worms and where it's endless suffering. But basically, consistently, Jesus always said, there are two roads, there are two destinations, there are two choices in life. And there's the wide, broad road that most people are on going away from God. And the end of that road leads into the place of darkness and torment and punishment. 
And then there's the narrow road that's difficult that leads Christ's way to heaven. So now let's go to the last two chapters. Sasha, I see that hand. So basically, Sasha is asking about uh, a realm of theology that's called the decrees of God. That's His it. plans that have never been revealed to us, but we see them by what he does. And basically, the decrees of God in theology are called the secret things. And it says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to God. But what is revealed is what we're supposed to operate on and uh, build our lives around. And, and what I get out of the millennium is that a perfect environment never uh -huh. makes people perfect. And I don't like plastic bags, you know, floating in the ocean. I don't like smoke and trees dying and the environment being ruined by humans. But no matter how much we protect and prever, uh, preserve and, and renew the world, it never will make people perfect and able to go to heaven. God shows that in the millennium. He makes all the curse of weeds and thistles and snakes and spiders and animals killing people and killing each other. He stops all that and makes people not die rapidly and they still won't follow him. I think like Jeremiah said in chapter 9, the millennium shows how wicked human hearts are. Because even in a perfect world given to them by God, the vast majority of every human on earth, when given a chance, follows Satan as soon as they can. So I think why God does that is never answered, just like he never answered Job why he killed his children and why he took all of his goods away from him. So we never know the why of the decrees of God, but what we do know is what God expects us to do. So instead of what many people do, spend their whole life speculating on why God allowed or did this or that, we should look at what he did tell us that he wants us to do because that's how we show we love him and want to obey him. Uh, Revelation 21 and 22 are to help Christians taste the joys of heaven before they get there. In fact, the Apostle Paul said once he got to see heaven, it was so good he would rather go there right now than stay any longer on earth. But I would say that most Christians are not like that. In fact, an American Bible teacher wrote a very interesting book about 20 years ago, and it's called Heaven Can Wait. And he said most Western Christians are so caught up in their education and their house and their children and their life and their security and their money that it's kind of like heaven is way out there somewhere and let's not hurry that at all. But in John 14, starting in verse 1, Jesus starts explaining that heaven is a dwelling place where we get to live forever in the same home and family as God. And the first eight verses of Revelation 21 are the description by Jesus Christ of the perfect home he's making for us, his bride, that he's going to marry and take to this place he prepared. Now we all wonder, what is heaven going to be like? Well, everything we need to know is written down in Revelation 21 and 22. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.9, I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them, but the Spirit has revealed them to us. Basically, the Lord gives a list. And if you want to look at Revelation 21, 27, he tells us what will be in heaven and what won't be in heaven. And it says, There shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Basically, God says heaven is all about what I promised. Emmanuel, God with us, that you get to live with me. In fact, that's what Jesus said in John 14, 3. Where I am, you're going to get to be also. And just like when you're in love on earth, you're always thinking about the person you love, and you're always trying to talk to them and spend time with them and plan with them, Jesus loves us and wants us to be with him. 
And that brings us back to what Jesus already told the church back in Revelation 3. Jesus wants us bearing fruit, obeying him, doing what he left us to do. Have you ever gotten an apple and taken a big bite out of it, and when you pulled it away, you looked, and you had half of a worm in your mouth because you bit it? Most of you probably not, because they invented pesticides in the last 25 years. The worms that spoil the fruit that God left us to do are little choices we make in life that don't please the Lord. Serving Christ is rarely comfortable and convenient. Getting, getting up early in the morning and reading your Bible, spending time praying when you have so much to do, going and talking to people that don't want to be talked to, is just not comfortable and it's not convenient. In fact, I saw the contrast when I served over here 40 years ago in Central Europe. We would go to churches in Romania where they were meeting out in the country in a barn that had all types of holes in the rooftop of the barn. And the people would sit on benches, and if it rained, they all just brought some type of rain protectant, and all the people on the bench had it on their heads, and they all sat there underneath, and no one stopped listening. They just sat there as it rained. And they sat on benches that didn't have backs like a chair, and the service usually went for four or five hours. And I said, why are you guys going for four or five hours? And they said, well, we don't know if this might be the very last service we ever have. If the guards take us to jail, this might be our last service. We want to get all we can get. In America, if the church building is not comfortable, and if you can't find a good parking space conveniently close to the door, many people keep driving on Sunday and they don't even have time to go to church. For 40 years, every Sunday, in every church I ever pastored, if it rained, the attendance was down noticeably. Because it's not comfortable or convenient to run and get your pretty shoes wet and get your clothes wet and to get yourself wet and to ruin your hair. I would rather stay home than go worship God. So comfort and convenience are like little worms that spoil the fruit of obeying God. Another one is being recognized by someone for what you did and commended for it. And another problem is security. We all want to be safe and secure and not lose our stuff and not lose anything. And we want to be comfortable and we want to be recognized and we want to be secure. And I think what we all need to ask ourselves is, will we hear Christ's well done? In fact, there's a clue in that passage in Matthew 25 that most of us don't think about. Jesus said, well done, good and faithful, and we think about that part. But he says, well done, good and faithful servants. A servant is someone who does the will of another. A servant is told what to do, and they do it. But a good servant and a faithful servant does what they're told to do with joy and even when no one's watching them. If you read the rest of Revelation 21, he talks about the incredible wonders of heaven. In fact, John is told to call it a new heaven and a new earth. There are two types of new things. New of the same and new of different. If I got a new red marker, I could either get a new red one that was this big and this big and was dark red, or I could just get a new one just like this. And there are two Greek words for new. If someone gets a new wife, that means they get a different wife, which is not a good thing to do. But the word that's used for heaven is it's new of the same kind. So everything in heaven is going to be a new of the same kind. So grass is going to be green and the sky is going to be blue and there's going to be water and it's not like all of a sudden we're in some science fiction world where we don't know where we are. And basically what you see in the description of heaven is everything that was precious on earth and hard to get is huge in heaven and easily accessible. People are always thinking, what, what is this streets of gold stuff? And, and they're thinking, 
gold and what will it feel like to walk on streets of gold. The idea is not that the gates are made of giant pearls and what would that look like. The idea is things that were precious to us that we wanted and were hard to get are going to be very huge and available and magnified in heaven. So the pearly gates remind us of the Lord's wanting to lavish us with beauty. And chapter 21 says there isn't going to be any temple in heaven because God's going to be right there and available. And chapter 22 says that the paradise that everyone has always looked for is what we're going to experience when we finally get in the presence of God. And basically, the whole 22nd chapter is saying we need to fall in love all over again with Jesus. In fact, in verse 5, he says, I'm going to make everything new. He gives everything a brand new, fresh beginning. But isn't it interesting that the book of Revelation ends in verse 17 with this invitation to come. And the Holy Spirit says come, and the bride of Christ, which is us, say come, and everyone who is thirsty and needy should come. Do you see why the early church loved the book of Revelation? They knew that heaven was just going to be the best of everything on earth, and it's going to be forever ours to share with God. So they didn't have to spend their life trying to experience everything and buy everything and do everything because it was going to be much better when they got to heaven. So they looked on themselves as servants that they were left on earth to do the will of God. I always end my classes on Revelation. I take out my car keys. So here's my, whatever kind of car that is, car key. And the question all of you have to answer is, who is the driver of your life? And Paul in Galatians 2.20 already said, the driver of my life is no longer me, but it's Christ. And I love to drive, but once in a while, at about 2.30 or 3 in the morning, driving across the country all night, I can't stay awake any longer. So I say, honey, would you like to drive the car? And I pull over to the edge of the road and come to a stop and I put the car into park and I turn it off and I pull out the keys and I get out of the car and I walk all the way around and I open the door and I say, here you go, honey, you can drive. In life, our lives are like driving a car and we're right there driving. And Jesus is sitting right next to us and he says, you know, I could do much better than you're doing. And we go over in the ditch and we get stuck and we have accidents and he patiently, lovingly sits there in the driver's seat and goes, it's okay, but I could do so much better if you just let me drive. The will of the Lord is that we are his servants and we let him drive. And the judgment seat of Christ is what... Martin Luther was talking about when he said, every day I get in the car, I think about the fact that someday I'm going to stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to answer to how much of my life I surrendered to him to drive. So the question is, are you getting ready every day of your life to stand? By the way, that's the Bema seat. That's Corinth. That's last month. Bonnie and I were there. That's the actual spot where Paul stood in front of the Bema when he was convicted and, and, and afflicted there. And that's the picture he used of heaven. So that's my message to you. Thanks for listening. I hope you'll become my friend on Facebook. And I hope you'll pray for us as a family.